So we're in, this first part is the second part of 9.1, 9.1 part 2. So we talked about sequences before, so we're just going to talk about a couple of theorems that, uh, that let, us, let us determine if a sequence has a limit, and um, then we'll talk about an important idea that's related to related to sequences that, that has kind of broader broader application. <clears throat> so the first thing we want to talk about is the squeeze theorem. And the idea of the squeeze theorem is if we can if we can put the terms of a particular sequence in between the terms of two convergent sequences then the sequence that we're interested in that's in between um, has to converge to our limit as well. So I'm just going to state the, state the squeeze theorem and then we will draw a picture. It, it's really, once we draw the picture, it's pretty, it makes, it's pretty intuitive. So we're going to say that we have two sequences and we, they both approach some limit. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is some limit, and that also equals a limit as n approaches infinity of b sub n. So both of these sequences approach this <coughs> approach this limit. If we can find an integer, just some number. In, so if we go far enough out in our terms of sequences that, forgot my R here, that this, this third sequence that we're interested in is between the terms of these two. So the terms of C, our sequence C, are all between the terms of these two once we get out past this integer n. So we go far enough in our terms of sequences that c is always between a and b, the term c is between a and b. So this tells us that the limit as n approaches infinity of c sub n also has to be L. So this just this gives us a tool for determining the convergence of a particular sequence. If we can make sure that the terms are between the terms of two other sequences, that that, that we know converge, that guarantees us that this that this sequence, particular sequence we're interested in will converge. And the way I picture this, if we draw draw a graph here, like we did the other day. And they don't, our sequences don't necessarily have to look like this. This is just how I, it helps me, helps me picture it. So I'm going to do my a sub n's in red. And I'll do my b sub n's in blue. So this is. a sub n here, and my blue is b sub n. And c sub n is, is jumping around out here somewhere. So here's a c sub n here, and maybe it jumps up and down like this. But then eventually, it's always between a sub n and b sub n. And I'm going to connect this with a little dotted line so we get an idea of what, what we're talking about. So c sub n is kind of oscillating. <coughs> but eventually, out here past some integer n, so if we say n is 
here, let's say. I know it's not lining up with my terms, but we get the idea. Um, out here past our integer n, c sub n is always between a sub n and b sub n. So those two, those two terms of those two sequences, a sub n and b sub n, are squeezing the limit of c sub n. This guarantees us that c sub n converges. This gives us one tool for finding, to, for determining if a series series converges. Hello. So intuitively makes makes some sense, right? Okay. <clears throat> another another theorem that we can use to to determine if uh, if sequences converge is uh, absolute value theorem. So what I'm doing now, we're just stating a few theorems. And then I want to um, talk about a, a kind of a more specific type of sequence. So our next theorem, the absolute value theorem. So we'll talk about these ideas and then, then we're going to go over, we're going to look at some take a look at some sequences. So we have a sequence a sub n, and we're trying to determine if this sequence converges. One tool that we can use is if the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of our terms equals zero. Than the limit of the original sequence is zero also. So we don't have to worry about the signs of the terms of the sequences. So if if our if our absolute value, the limit of our absolute value the value approaches zero, then our original the limit as our as n approaches infinity of our original sequence. So squeeze theorem, absolute value theorem, just a couple of tools that we can use to determine if sequences converge. Questions on that? And usually, usually when we're talking about sequences, if we what we did yesterday is we, we related a sequence, the terms of a sequence to a function, and then um, if we then we can use the tools for limits of functions. To, to determine if our sequence converges. Usually you can you can do that. Um, sometimes you might have to apply some other tools. Usually you can you, you use what you know about functions. So what we want to talk about next is uh, is a type of sequence called a bounded and monotonic sequence. So this this gets us closer, I said at the beginning of the unit that, that when we talk about sequences in series we get closer to kind of the heart of heart of calculus when we're talking about limits and, and convergence. Bounded and monotonic is really an extremely important idea uh, for the foundations, foundations of calculus. So that we want to develop the idea of bounded and monotonic and then we'll then we'll talk about that a little bit and then we're going to relate sequences to series. So when we're talking about, when I say, um, say bounded, what, what do you think, what do you think we're talking about? If I, if we're talking about a sequence being bounded, what do we think that's going to tell us about our sequence? What is, what is, what do we think, what do we think of the word bounded? <laughs> Cer certain domain and range, so it has something to do with, um, with, the, so there's there's some kind of restriction. We're thinking of some kind of restriction. C. What's that? C. C? Yes. Yeah. You're saying yes. <laughs> okay. I thought you were saying C as in plus C. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was thinking more calculus. Um, so bounded has to do with with how how large it how large it can get. Monotonic. Monotonic. Anybody have an idea what monotonic might be? What does mono mean? One. 
and tonic tone. So it, it has there. It's doing it's doing one one thing is really what monotonic is telling us. So we have something to do with bounded. Monotonic tells us it's it's kind of doing one thing. So we're we're going to say that a sequence is monotonic if it only increases or stays constant, or only decreases and stays constant. So it's either constantly growing or staying constant, or constantly decreasing or staying constant. It doesn't go back and forth between increasing and decreasing. So we say A sub n is monotonic and we use this, this weird math language. Um, if its terms are non-increasing So they never increase, so they're only decreasing, or non-decreasing. So this means they never get smaller, they only get bigger. So I can write, um, I can write, uh, if I write it in symbols, I could say a sub 1 greater than or equal to a sub 2 greater than or equal to a sub 3, greater than or equal to dot dot dot, greater than or equal to a sub n, greater than or equal to dot dot dot. So this tells me that which, which, which of my terms is the largest here? a sub 1. So would this be non-increasing or non-decreasing? Non-increasing. So this means that the terms, they either are constantly getting smaller, they might stay constant, but they never increase. This, so this is how we write it in symbols. And then we turn the inequalities around for a non-decrease. So we'd say a sub 1, less than or equal to a sub 2, less than or equal to a sub 3, less than or equal to dot dot dot, less than or equal to a sub n, and they keep going. So this is how we determine if our sequence is non-increasing or non-decreasing. So we have some definition of the terms, and we want to show that it's that our sequence is monotonic. We need to show that one of these whoops, one of these uh, inequalities holds to show that it's non-increasing or non-decreasing. Now this is one of the places where I said the the idea where we could say, oh well, the 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 this this thing is bottom heavy or the top gets bigger faster than the bottom. Um, I'm going to want something a little a little stronger <coughs> than that to show that something is non-increasing or non-increasing. It's just a little more analytic argument that something doesn't increase or doesn't decrease. Something about a limit, something about a maximum value, or you can set up an inequality and show that that inequality is true for all n, but uh, you need to make your arguments a little stronger than, than top heavy, <coughs> bottom heavy, that kind of thing. All right. so. Now we know what non-increasing, non-decreasing mean. So let's talk about, let's make our, our idea of bounded a little more formal. And then we'll, then we'll decide what a bounded and monotonic sequence does. So here's our monotonic, idea of monotonic. So we want to know about a bounded sequence. So bound, we, we can have two kinds of bounds. Bounded above, so our sequence a sub n, and what, what would you guess we're going to say if we're saying our sequence is bounded above? What, what are we talking about? There's an upper limit, basically. There's some number up here that my sequence never gets larger than. The terms of my sequence never get larger than this number. 
So we're going to say in, in math in math language. So we're going to say if there is a real number M such that a sub n is less than or equal to m for all n. So just what, just what you said. There's some number up here that my terms are all less than. We call m the upper bound. We call m, m is the upper bound. So what we're working towards here is we, what we t when we talked about sequences yesterday, we were a little less formal than this. This is really the more formal idea of how we're going, to, how, how you deal with with sequences in in a in a little more formal setting. All right, and then we're going to we're going to bound our sequence below. B sub n is bounded below. And what we're going to do here is just turn our inequality around, basically. Bounded below means there's some, some number below which our terms never get. So we have a real number n. <coughs> such that a sub n is greater than or equal to n for all little n. And we call n the lower bound. Yes? Oh, thank you. It would be nice if we could just say that, that we're talking about some sequence and then apply the bounds of a different sequence to make determinations about that. Um, all right. <clears throat> so what do you guess we're going to say now about a bounded and monotonic sequence? We have a sequence. It's either always getting smaller or always getting larger. but it either has an it has an upper bound, it's getting larger, but it has this upper bound, or it's getting smaller and it has this lower bound. Anything we're going to say converges. So we call a sequence that has an upper bound and a lower bound bounded. We call that a bounded sequence. Now we can we can use this idea. There's there's one other idea that we're not going to go into. It's a little little more technical than we're going to talk about. Um, but when we're talking about real numbers, real numbers have this property that they are complete, which means there aren't any holes in the number line. There are no gaps. So if an if a sequence has an an upper bound, it has what we call a least upper bound. So there's some some number that's the smallest upper bound that that is an upper bound. And there's also a greatest lower bound. So those those two are important because if we had some gaps or holes, we could we could run into some problems. Using that, and if you if you go on and you take uh, analysis or anything like that, you'll talk about least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds a lot. Um, but we can say once we know that that a bounded monotonic sequence converges.
So a bounded monotonic sequence converges. That's, that's our conclusion. <coughs> and part of what we're going to do, part, part of what some of, your, some of your problems will involve, and part of what I will ask you to do is I will give you some sequence, I'll define a sequence for you, and say show this sequence converges by showing that it's bounded and monotonic. So to show it's bounded and monotonic, you need to show that it has an upper bound and a lower bound, and that the, the terms are non-decreasing or non-increasing. So for it to be bounded, remember, it has to have an upper and a lower bound. You show that it has an upper and a lower bound, and then you show that the terms are non-decreasing and or non-decreasing. So part of the, some of your problems, part of what I'll ask you to do is to show that a sequence is bounded and monotonic. So let's look, let me look, I have some, a couple of examples that I want to go through just thinking about sequences and thinking about these ideas. So let me grab those um, to remember where I put them. Right here. Here. 9.2, there we go. All right, let me grab a picture of this. Okay, so I want to talk about these, these questions. So we want to find examples of all of these things. So part A, we want to find, we're trying to find a monotonically increasing sequence, monotonically increasing sequence that converges to 10. So by, on your own, in partners, whatever, if you can come up with a monotonically increasing sequence that converges to 10. So monotonically increasing means the terms are always getting bigger, but the limit is 10. So work on that for a second. And then we'll talk about it. This. Um, all right, so, so Max has an idea that my sequence is a sub n equals 10. Would that fit our definition? We, what did we say the definition of monotonically increasing was? Think about how we wrote our inequality. It had a less than or equal to. So every term could equal 10. And it would be monotonically increasing because it'd be non-decreasing, right? So that that would be an example of a monotonically increasing sequence that converges to ten. That's probably the easiest one. All right. So, well, I think Max Max is a slide box. I guess I figured I thought of the second easiest one. <laughs> so what's anybody else? What did someone? Anybody else come up with an idea? Negative whatever. Negative. So uh, I'm going to write it this way, 10 minus 1 over n. How about that one? So when n is 1, we start at n, when n is 1, first term of our sequence is 9. And then we are subtracting successively smaller numbers. And the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n is 0. So we end up, our limit is 10. So our upper bound would be 10. And our lower bound is, what's the smallest this can be? Nine. That would be our lower bound. So that would be our argument. We could say when n equals one, a sub n, a sub one is nine. Doesn't get lower than that. We, we define our sequence as a function of the positive integers. So the lowest, the lowest term, the smallest term is nine. The largest term, the limit, is 10. So it never gets larger than 10. And it's constantly increasing. Okay, how about part B? A monotonically increasing bounded sequence that does not converge. We want to find an example of that. <coughs> do I need to pause here? <laughs> All right, what did, what did you say, Will? Doesn't by definition of bounded monotonic sequence have to Yes. This is a trick question. So this, this, this is uh, impossible. Very nice, Will. Uh, a bounded, 
a bounded monotonically increasing sequence has to converge. That that we said that that was that was our that was our theorem. That that a bounded monotonically sequence, a monotonically increasing bounded sequence has to converge. So part B is impossible, and this is a uh, impossible factorial. That's an exclamation. All right. Um, how about a sequence? A sequence that converges to three fourths for part C. We, Max already has his answer. <laughs> three fourths. There's our sequence. Sequence is three fourths. A any anybody think of something more interesting? Three fourths minus one over n. <laughs> Even more interesting than that. 1 over n plus 3 fourths. <laughs> 1 over n factorial. <laughs> okay. I, I, I thought of I thought of like a, a rational function. So I, I thought of like 3n over 4n plus 1. Something like that. And if we're thinking of a rational function as, as n approaches infinity, our, our limit, our horizontal asymptote is at the ratio of the leading coefficients. Uh, that's that's what I thought. That I thought. <coughs> but yeah, three fourths works. Uh, three fourths plus one over n factorial works. Um, how about uh, how about part D? An unbounded sequence that converges to a hundred. Hmm. What is it, Josh? Can an unbounded sequence <coughs> converge? Yes. Yeah. Oh wait, no, but your definition of bounding is that it's just, right? Right. Unbounded, what, what were you going to say now? I mean, I've got one. You've got one? Okay. Yeah. Um, and you're saying this isn't this isn't bounded? This is bounded? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, because any function that isn't bounded is going to converge. Right. So this let's 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 talk about Max's idea here for a second. Is this is if we have this sequence, is this bounded? Yeah. What's our what is our upper bound? What would be the upper bound of this? 100? What would be the lower bound? If n equals 1, we're starting at n equals 1. <laughs> what would be the lower bound? 99? So this would be, this would be, this would not be monotonic because it's, it's, it increases and decreases, so this would not be monotonic, but it would still be bound. But we're, we're thinking, you're thinking of that? Because this is, this is, this is bounded. This sequence is bounded. 100 above, 99 below. What if it equals just 100? That's still bounded. Would that, that would still be bounded. That would be super bounded. Yeah, that would be <laughs> super bounded. <laughs> so just, yes, if it's unbounded, if it's unbounded, it can't converge. When n is like even, it's yeah. above 100. When n is even, it's above 100? We should even squeeze there. Yeah. Okay, this could be on I, I think I'm... One hundred divided by, in parentheses, one plus one over n. Divided by one plus one over n. Yes. All right. Um, so you let's let's go back here really quick. Max says that when n is even, it's greater than a hundred. Yeah. I mean. Bounds you gave don't work for me, but I think it's still bounded. Okay, so maybe we were wrong on the bounds. Yeah. Um, so the way, the way I'm looking at this, when n equals one, this is this equals 99. Yeah. So then we're we're adding we're adding successively. So uh, when, when n equals two, it's one hundred. One hundred and one fourth. When n equals four, it would be one hundred and and one sixteenth. Yeah. So. So it's bounded, but not by 100. It, the upper bound isn't 100. 
more than 100. You're right. Yeah. Um, let's let's look at this one really quick, and then we'll move on. 100 divided by 1 plus 1 over n. Is that bounded? Yes. When n equals 1, this is 50. And as n approaches infinity, 1 over n approaches <coughs> 0. So this approaches 100. So it's bounded below by 50 and above by 100. So Josh, Josh caught it first. An unbounded sequence diverges. Doesn't converge. So number part D is impossible. But the, good, the, the way you guys were thinking about sequences, I was, that's very good. Very good. Thinking about, can I make this work? This doesn't make sense. That's good. All right. I want to list, I want to list a, couple of, uh, a couple of important sequences that, uh, that come up frequently. Just they're, they're good ones to know, limits of, of sequences that come up frequently. They're good to know. And as we go on, we'll talk about how we show that these converge. Um, so before we move on, any questions about, about this part? Okay, and I just want to make sure I'm still... Yes. All right, limits, uh, important limits, or limits that come up frequently. Limits you see often. Um, the limits as n approaches infinity of natural log of n over n equals zero. Looking at that one quickly, how do you think, how could you prove that that limit was zero? Natural log of n is less than n. So this would be less than the limit as n approaches infinity of, well, that would tell us it's less than n over n. That would tell us it's less than 1. So think about that one a little bit. Um, the limit <coughs> as n approaches infinity of the nth root of n is 1. The limit as n approaches infinity of x to the 1 over n equals 1, and this is for uh, x, I'm going to put this here, x greater than 0. And we're saying x is a constant here, x is fixed. <coughs> the limit as n approaches infinity of x to the n equals 0 for the absolute value of x less than 1. Limit as n approaches infinity, 1 plus x to the n to the nth power. We recognize that one. That one's probably the most important one. It does have to do with interest, yes. This is e to the x. And it came about, this, this sequence came about from comp, uh, calculating compound interest. And finally, the limit as n approaches infinity x to the n over x, and this is a factorial, equals 0. And for these, we're saying x x is x is constant x remains fixed so x isn't varying as n varies so we're saying for a particular x um, looking at this one anybody have an idea of how we might how we might show that how we might prove that this one's a fun I like the, the proof of this one this one's kind of fun similar to what you said about natural log of n over n make a similar kind of argument. So so think keep this one in the back of your head. We'll talk about this one later because this one's this one's kind of nice. I like the proof of that one. 
All right, so these are limits. I'm not going to ask you, uh, won't, a, won't ask you to prove these, but these are limits that you will need to use. Uh, they show up often when we're working with sequences in series. That, that we'll need to, we just need to know that the, these are, these particular limits are, are the values they are. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. In factorial. There we go. Thank you. All right. So there's. The, so we're done. We're done talking about sequences. What I want to do next, we've we've sat and talked for a little bit, and we have to double up because we missed all of those days for the rain. Um, I want to take a, a break. Um, so we're going to we're going to jump into section nine point two. So that's what we what we talked about. What we just talked about in section nine point one is is probably as as mathematically technical as it's going to be with. Um, with sequences and series. What we want to do is use use these tools to develop a, a set of kind of working tools for finding the convergence of sequences. And really we're more what in, in this class we're going to be more interested in series. How do we determine if a series converges? Um, and as we're working through the series, I want you to think about the, the, the jokes that I like to tell about a solution exists. This is where we see that idea. We show that a series converges. We have no idea what it converges to. We don't know what the sum is. So we're saying a solution exists. So I just, so that, kind of, kind of to tie that, that joke to, to reality, is a, a big part of what we're doing in this, in this chapter saying a solution exists. The series converges. So um, I, I kind of just enjoy that, that little twist there. All right, so we're in section 9.2 now. And we're talking about series. And hopefully after this, this semester, after this year, series and sequences won't be your least favorite topic in, in calculus. It might be, um, it might be fluid force. <laughs> All right, so we use, we use sequences, we use sequences to represent infinite summation. So we have uh, we have an infinite series. Can't draw a brace today. So we're saying a sub n is an infinite sequence. Our infinite series is just the sum of the terms. And we're just adding a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus dot dot dot. Um, this is an infinite series. Do we remember? We had all these rules for determining convergence. How do we define the sum? Do you remember how we find, define the sum of an infinite series? It has to do with an A and an N. There's a limit. There's definitely a limit in there, yes. Um, um, so that, that that's one particular that's one particular kind of series. In general, in general, this is this is our connection between our, our connection between series and sequences. Sequences a, a, a lot of times seem like the stepchild when we're talking talking about these things. We're talking about sequences. Okay, now we're do, we're done with that. We're going to talk about series. To find the sum of the series. We look at the sequence of partial sums. So 
So this is this is the where sequences and series tie together. This is how we find the sum. So we're going to say the partial sum S sub 1 is A sub 1. The partial second partial sum, A sub 1 plus A sub 2. The third partial sum, we add three terms. <coughs> so we get a sequence of partial sums, S1, S2, S3, all the way down to S sub n, where we're adding together n terms. Dot, 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 plus a sub n. So there's our sequence of partial sums. If the sequence of partial sums converge, converges, then the series converges. So this is how we, how we determine if a series converges. It has to do with sequences, the sequence of partial sums. So we say if the sequence of partial sums converges, then the series converges. And the limit of the sequence of partial sums is called the sum of the series. So all these tools that we'll develop in this chapter to find the limit of a sequence or to, to determine if a sequence or a series converges has to do with techniques of guaranteeing <coughs> that our sequence of partial sums converges. So the sequence of partial sums is really the key to the convergence of a series. So it's important, it's important that we see that connection. Series and sequences are not disconnected, they're very connected. And the way we write this is, and we've all seen this before, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n equals s, if s is the limit of the partial, the sequence of partial sums. Now we usually don't use this definition to find, to, to the, the, the decide if we have a limit, to find, the, decide if our sequence converges, our series converges, but we can. So let's look at an example of that. Um, so let's say we have, we want to find sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. <coughs> and we want to, we want to find the sum. We want to des decide if this converges using our definition of convergence. So I'm going to write out some terms. First term, what's the first term going to be here? Help me out with the terms. 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus dot dot dot. So let's look at the partial sums. So S sub 1 is 1. S sub 2 is 1 plus 1 half or 3 halves. S sub 3 is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth. And I add that all together and I get 7 fourths. So what we're looking for, if we're using the definition, we're looking for a pattern in this sequence of partial sums. <coughs> So if I keep going, I could write S of n equals 1 plus 
one half plus one fourth. We're adding all these together, plus dot 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 dot, plus one over two to the n minus one, whatever n is. Anybody see a pattern relating the, the terms of the sequence of partial sums to n? That's really what we have to do if we're using the definition. So let's look at the numerator. 3, 7, if we did s sub 4. Um, okay, so 2 to the, what did you say, 2 to the n minus 1? 2 n minus 1 over Oh, 2n? 2n minus 1? Over n? Over n plus 1? No? Um, so this, is, this would be the process. I'm not going to make us go through this all right now. Uh, I've had students on tests they couldn't figure out a, a particular series, a test for a particular series, and they were able to figure out the pattern of the sequence of partial sums, and I was pretty impressed. This turns out to be, if we listed out more terms, it would, pro it would be a little easier to see. This is uh, 2 to the n minus 1. I thought you'd, got, you'd gotten that. I was impressed. Uh, over 2 to the n minus 1. And I can rewrite that as 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. And as n approaches infinity, what is the limit of this thing? 2. Then limit equals 2. So that, that sequence or that series converges to 2. The sum of the sequence or the sum of the series is 2. So using the definition, that's the kind of thing you have to do. You have to write out your, your terms of your partial sums and find a pattern and relate that pattern to n and then find the limit as n approaches infinity. Can be very challenging. Can be very challenging. But that's, to use a definition, that's, that's what we would have to do. We want to, what we're doing in this chapter is developing some shortcuts to finding, to finding these, determining the convergence of these series. Um, I want to show us another special kind of another special kind of series. So again, what what I was emphasizing here is a connection between sequences, the sequence of partial sums, and the limit of a series. Let's look at another kind of series. What if we wanted to find the sum of n equals one to infinity? of 1 over n times n plus 1. Anybody have an idea of what we would do here? <coughs> let, me, let me write this out. What if we were looking at, rather than this series, what if we were looking at the integral of 1 over n times n plus 1 dn? What technique would we use? What integration technique? Well, if we multiply it out, we would need a, a, some something for our dn, right? Because this would be n squared plus n, and a dn would be 2n. Max got it. Partial fractions. Use partial fractions. And that's, a, that's an exclamation of, of joy, right? Yes. So we use partial fractions. So I can rewrite, I can rewrite the sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over n times n plus 1 as, if I do my technique of partial fractions, 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. So we do our, our partial fractions technique. If you don't remember, uh, you might need to brush up on that because there, there are some questions where, where, you'll, where you do that. If you need a reminder, you can talk about that um, uh, outside of class time. 
or as we go over homework, we could, we could do a reminder. And now we're going to write out some terms of this series. So this is the sum, and a really cool thing happens. N equals 1 to infinity of, uh, rather than that, I'm going to write equals. You don't need to rewrite that. Equals. And I start plugging in numbers. 1 minus 1 half plus 1 half minus 1 third plus 1 third minus 1 fourth plus dot dot dot. What's happening here? I have a minus 1 half and a plus 1 half. A minus 1 third and a plus 1 third. I'll get a minus 1 fourth and a plus 1 fourth. All of those cancel out. <coughs> and what's that? And this equals 1. These are really cool kinds of series. We call this a telescoping series. So, so last year when you studied series, you knew how to find the sum of what kind of series? A geometric series. Now we know how to find the sum of two kinds of series. If the problem asks you to find the sum, you know it's either going to be a geometric series or a telescoping series. They call it telescoping series because it's like the old spy glasses that are stretched out and then you push them down and they all collapse. So we're taking these terms of the sequences and we're subtracting and they all collapse down. All right, so we call that a telescoping series. To find uh, the sum of a telescoping series, we need to use, use partial fractions, write out some of your terms, and sometimes in telescoping series, it's not adjacent terms that cancel, it's terms that are several, several terms away from each other that cancel, so you might have to write out a few terms to see the pattern of what is canceling out and what's left. But telescoping series are nice because you can find the sum, use partial fractions, and you can uh, and, and you get this nice collapsing thing. So now we now we know how to find the sum of another kind of series. All right, one other type of series that we know how to find the sum of we already mentioned it, geometric series. Geometric series probably are probably our favorite kind of series because we they're they're simple they're nice and we know how to we know how to find the sum so we can write a geometric series in the form n equals one to infinity uh, or usually usually a geometric series we can start at zero n equals zero to infinity a r to the n and if I write out some terms a plus a r plus AR squared, plus dot dot dot, plus AR to the n. And we want A not equal to zero. So we, we actually want to have a series. We call R the ratio, or the common ratio. And from what we know about geometric series, when do geometric series converge? When absolute value of R is less than one, the series converges. And if absolute value of R is greater than or equal to one, our series diverges. Um, I will do the. I will show you the proof of this uh, another time. I'm not going to do it today. We've, we've been sitting for quite a while, um, and we can find the sum. <coughs> Converges to, and I think that, that you were saying this is what you were thinking of. Our sum converges to the sum 
a over 1 minus r. The proof of this is the proof that this converges and that this is the sum is, is kind of nice, not, not really complicated, but, uh, but I'm not going to do it, not going to do it today. Um, so let's look at just one quick example with a geometric series and then we'll be done. And let's go back really quickly. Again, geometric series, we can write in the form A times R to the N. We write it out, it looks like this. Converges when our ratio, absolute value of our ratio is less than one. All right, so if we had one minus one half plus one fourth, minus one eighth plus dot dot dot. We want to find the sum. So how can I write this? How can I write the terms of this, this series? I'm going to suggest we start at zero. Usually with geometric series, we'll start at zero. Usually. Then negative one. Negative one to the n. So we have an alternating sign, so we know we need a negative one to the n. And then one over two. Okay. Is there a more compact way I could write this? Some one over, what did you say, Max? Is there a friendlier way I could write this that we would recognize as something familiar? I don't know. How about <laughs> negative one half to the end? So what kind of series is this? Geometric? R equals negative one half. A equals one. So our sum, one over one minus negative one half. And we get, what does that come out to be? Two thirds. <coughs> so our sum is two thirds. So when we when we have so now we now we have tools for finding the sums of two different kinds of series: telescoping series, geometric series. Or if we can find a pattern in our sequence of partial sums, then we can find the sum of some crazy series that way. That, that technique can be pretty difficult. All right, questions? All right, that was a, that was a marathon session today. Um, I don't think we have to do many, any more of those. Um, homework. Yeah, we have, we have two, two sections of homework also. <laughs> All right, there you go.